Oh, okay. Okay, so we're, first we're going to talk about um, <clears throat> how they got into the predicament they were in. How the people of Israel ended up in Babylon to begin with. And you have to go all the way back to the first book of the Bible, to Genesis, to figure this out. So I've got you a little timeline up here. This is actually the timeline that we use in children's classes. <clears throat> and we're going to start with Genesis. And what I've put is I've put kind of where these fall in the timeline. Okay, the books of the Bible, and this is all the Old Testament books, books where they fall in the timeline. So we're just going to kind of go down through there. But we're going to start in Genesis. And as you know, Genesis has the... Um, has the story of creation, and then it moves to the story of Noah and the destruction of the entire world. And then it moves into Abraham, uh, which is God's chosen family, his son Isaac, and his son Jacob. Now, there were three things that were promised to Abraham way back, and I've written them up here on the board. The first one is in Genesis 12, verses 2 through 3, and I will read you what it this is when Abraham was first called. <clears throat> this is what God said. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you I will curse and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So that was the first promise that was made to Abraham. The second promise that was made to Abraham is Genesis 17. In Genesis 17, verse 8, <clears throat> he told him where he was going to live. He said, the whole land of Canaan, where you are now an alien, I will give you as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. So part of this same covenant that he's made with Abraham, he has told him, all nations will be blessed through you, and now he says, and I'm going to give you the land of Canaan. The third promise made to Abraham comes in Genesis 22. <clears throat> Abraham is tested when God tells him to offer his only son, Isaac. <clears throat> he tells him now in verse 17, he says, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the cities of their enemies, and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed because you have obeyed me. So as part of the covenant made to Abraham, he's going to have from his one son, Isaac, he is going to have an, an, an entire nation. So he's, he's going to be blessed. His offspring will be blessed forever. It's going to be huge, a massive, and he's going to be given the land of Canaan. So those promises were made to him. How did we come up with 12 tribes? How many sons did Jacob have? He had, he had 12. He had 12. Now, Levi, his son, did not get any land allotment. So you take off Levi and you've got 11. Joseph also did not receive any land allotment. So then you've got 10. But two of Joseph's, Ephraim and Manasseh, will become the 12 tribes. So Levi doesn't get anything, but Joseph's descendants get two parts, Ephraim and Manasseh. That's how they came up with the 12 tribes. Also in the book of Genesis, if you've been doing your daily Bible reading, you're through Genesis and into Exodus by now. But um, Jacob's name was changed to Israel. That's how we come up with the Israelites. The kids, the kids are funny when they figure that out. Oh, <laughs> slowly figured that his name was changed to Israel, and that's how they became that. So um, God has made this promise, and I'm going to call it a seed promise, okay? And now there is an ongoing conflict or struggle to fulfill this covenant promise. Satan will do whatever he can to thwart God's plan, Okay. But we must understand the viciousness of Satan and his intent to harm that seed. We can also know that no matter how powerful Satan is, there is a power greater than him. That power is the person of God. Okay? The purposes of God will be carried out. Nothing will stop God's progress toward his promised and purposed goals. Okay? So he has a seed plan is what he has. At the end of Genesis... 
you find out one member of the family of this family is in Egypt. Who's that? Joseph. Joseph. Joseph is in Egypt. The rest of the family is still over here in Palestine or the Canaan area. They're over here. What's happening all over the world? Famine. Famine. Devil's working hard. Devil's working really hard. And, and what happens is they go to Egypt because, because Joseph was so perfectly placed there to provide for the whole world during this famine. They go to Egypt, travel to Egypt, and they end up staying. Actually, 70 members of the family go to live there. That's recorded at the end of Genesis. So um, you find out that there's a famine, but God's, God's going to provide. He used Joseph to provide for that. But then there's another issue. Joseph dies and is buried, and we have a Pharaoh that comes along who, yeah. he, he, they're scared. He's scared. Yeah. Okay, by this time, my Bible does not have a specific number, but my footnotes say that there should have been about 600,000 men. Mm. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? That's a lot. And um, so they had grown into this massive nation of people right there in Goshen. And the Pharaoh was scared and he made them slaves. And so, and, and they cry out to God and God hears them. He sees them. And so he's going to send Moses. <clears throat> he brings up uh, the book of Exodus starts with Moses. What do you think Exodus means? Going out, going exit. <laughs> They're going to exit Egypt. So we're in Exodus, and here we've got Moses, his chosen leader. And ten mighty plagues will follow, and God will defeat Satan, and that seed line will continue. Because not only does that seed line get to leave Egypt, they cross the Red Sea on a dry ground, and they go into the desert. So the Passover is established. Why do they call it the Passover? That's right. The death angel passed over when he saw the blood of the lamb around the doorposts. Is that not foreseeing many things into the future? There you go. So the Passover is established in this book, and he will go up onto Mount Sinai and receive the Ten Commandments in Exodus. The tabernacle is built uh, to very specific specifications. And Aaron will be designated as the first high priest, and the tribe of Levi from here on out will be the ones that will take down the tabernacle, put up the tabernacle, move the tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant. They will also do this help with the sacrifices and the cleansing of the utensils. Very specifically does Leviticus tell you about all the duties of the Levites in, in, um, in Exodus, you know. So anyway, that's what that's about. The books that follow Exodus are Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. So Leviticus in Greek means relating to the Levites. And it will outline Old Testament sacrifices. If you ever wanted to read about the Old Testament sacrifices, it's in the book of Leviticus because it talks about the burnt offering, the grain offering, the fellowship offering, the sin offering, the guilt offering, all of the, all of the sacrifices that the Levites were carrying out. And you find out rather quickly in chapter 10 that God expects it to be done exactly like he said because it's the death of Nadab and Abihu that occur for offering strange fire. <laughs> strange fire, and that's in chapter 10. So this book also covers laws of clean, cleanness, uh, moral laws that deal with honesty, thievery, idolatry. Um, it goes into great detail about the Day of Atonement, when the high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies. He entered twice that day for the sins of himself and for the sins of the people. Uh, Leviticus will also give, in chapter 26, the blessings and curses of the covenant. We, we briefly looked at that in the book of Daniel, mm -hmm. that when you do what you were supposed to do and you obey and you follow God's laws, there were blessings upon blessings upon blessings. <clears throat> and what happens if you are disobedient and you don't follow God's law? There was curses. That's chapter 26. 
So that chapter is really important because the people will decide ultimately not to abide by God's law. And the curses will befall this great nation because of their disobedience. If you ever wondered how the nation ended up with Assyria coming in and taking Israel and Babylon coming in and taking Judah, this chapter will tell you why. This chapter will tell you. So you get to the book of Numbers. Numbers is a census list, but it is more than just that. It outlines 40 years of wandering around in the desert. Why did the people have to wander around the desert for 40 years? <laughs> okay, the little children's song, 10 were bad and 2 were good. 10 were bad and 2 were good. Well, that's the story here. It's in chapter 14. I'm in, I want you to turn there. I want you to look at Numbers 14. So look at Numbers 14. It's a great story. Um, it actually starts in 13. It starts in 13. And mid, midway through 13 is the report on the, on the spies that have gone into the land. <clears throat> um, ten of them were like, no, we can't do it, we can't do it. They incite the whole community, basically. Uh, but two of those guys say they can. Who are the two that say that they can take it? Who are these guys? Joshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb. This is first. Okay, so we're hearing about Joshua and Caleb. All right. So you get to chapter 14. And the people are so mad, they're about to stone Moses. They're about to kill their appointed leader, okay? And God's, it, it made him very angry. Uh, from about 13, verses 13, verse 16, Moses is, is, is negotiating with God for the people. <laughs> That's basically what he's doing. He's saying, uh, if, you, if you kill him now, what are all the other nations going to say about you? kind of thing. Please don't kill him. It makes us look bad, God. <laughs> it's going to make you look get, look bad. And so God does relent. If you look in verse um, 30 of that same chapter, chapter 14, not one of you will enter the land. Uh, if you look down in verse 34, for 40 years, one year for each of the 40 days that you explore the land, you will suffer for your sins and know what it is like to have me against you. So now we know why they had to wander around for 40 years, okay? Um, there, that's, that's one time that Moses' leadership was um, opposed, but that's not the only time. Um, in chapter 12, you have Aaron and Miriam opposed to Moses because he took a Cushite wife. And God was they're jealous or something, but God was angry, and um, Miriam became leprous for seven days because of that, and apparently, hopefully, learned her lesson. Uh, in chapter 16, there are more people that come up against, against Moses and Aaron. And they incite the whole community again against them. Um, God's going to handle things that time with the plague. He handles it that time. And in chapter 17, you've got the miraculous account of Aaron's rod that grows leaves and blossoms and almonds all in one night. <laughs> and that was God's way of saying, I have chosen Aaron and he's going to be the leader and and that's the end of the story. You know, there's not going to be anything else. So um, all of those, those really interesting stories take, take place in the book of Numbers. In the book of Numbers, you learn how very ungrateful the children of Israel are. They are constantly complaining about food, water, and leadership. And even though there are some battles that are fought in Numbers, God's with them and they are victorious, even, even because of their complaining all the time. So we get to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy's name means repetition of the law. <laughs> and if you're doing your Bible reading. Right. And, and their clothes don't ever wear out, and they don't have to work for their food. No, nope. their shoes don't wear out, their clothes don't wear out. That Yes, they don't ever have to do anything for their food. That's right. Um, the repetition of the law in Deuteronomy. Obedience is reiterated again. The Ten Commandments are listed again. God will again make it clear that he demands absolute allegiance. Um, the book of Deuteronomy is Moses' farewell speech, farewell address to the people. 
and he has to choose a leader. So who does he choose? Joshua, Joshua one of those good guys that came back with a good report. One commentator said that opposed to the matter-of-fact narratives of Leviticus and Numbers, the book of Deuteronomy comes to us from Moses' heart in a warm, personal form of expression. This book shows us how much God loves his people. One big note about Deuteronomy. Chapter 18, God will send, he says, I'm going to send you prophets from among your own people. That's in chapter 18. He introduces the prophet at that time. He tells them that he's going to raise up a prophet from among the people and he will put his words in their mouth. And whenever they speak, they will be speaking for God. In chapter 30 to end Deuteronomy, he offers the people life or death. So all those five books um, make up the books of the law. That's what they're called. Um, they are very important because they give instructions on how to be a success. Success as a nation, success as a community, success as a person. These are, these are your guidelines on how to be successful. Choose not to follow God's commandments, and there will be heartache, difficulties, and consequences. Basically, that's what he tells them. So, one more thing. I want to place another book of the Bible. You can see, I put it up there. And you say, why do you place Job way over there with Genesis? Well, there's... There's several, there's several reasons. <clears throat> Job, how was Job's wealth measured? Job's wealth was measured in cattle. Yeah. Who else's wealth was measured like that? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob was all about the accumulation of cattle, that kind of thing. Okay? So that's why they date it. That's one reason they date it. Another reason is Job lived to be 140. In Genesis chapter 6, I don't have that up there. In Genesis chapter 6, this is before the flood, verse 3, God numbered the days of the people to 120. So how old did Job live? He was 140 when he died. You can place the book of Job before the flood. That's two reasons. One more reason I think Job, Job is there. Um, the last reason is because during the Genesis time period, uh, men served as priests of their family. And Job served as a priest for his family. That's found in Job 1, verse 5. So it's a really interesting thing when you think about where Job is in the Bible and where he probably lived. That doesn't mean that the book of Job was written then. It may have been written later. But that's probably the time period of when Job lived. And I found that really interesting. So let's move on. We got through the books of the law. We get to Joshua. Joshua has his own book because he's such a great guy. And here they go. They're going to come. They're going to, Joshua's going to be the leader who takes the children of Israel from wandering in the desert to warriors. And they begin to take the land that was promised all the way at Abraham in Genesis. And I love the book of Joshua because it's full of great stories. The story of Rahab the story of Jericho, the story of Achan not doing what he's supposed to do, the Gibeonite deception, the people of Gibeon that came to him and, and, and deceptively tricked them, basically. And, and the, it also tells all the land that was conquered and which tribes took that land. So it, it lots the land out. Um, but here is a very costly mistake made by the Israelite people in this book, too. They fail to take all the land. Instead, they begin to settle down, and they don't finish conquering everything. God told them, you go in and take it all, and they don't do it. Um, Joshua basically says that they left the Canaanites in the land, but the Canaanites is just a generic term for all sorts of people, okay? And it specifically says that the Jebusites that resided in Jerusalem, that they didn't take them. The Jebusites continued to live there. Do you know who finally took Jerusalem? David. David. Mm -hmm. That's right. So the Jebusites were left. Um, somebody else that was left were oh, the, the Ammonites. Um, no, Amorites. Amorites. It is Gideon who will finally conquer the Amorites, and that's not till the next book. 
Who is it that was a thorn in Samson's flesh? And a thorn, who had Goliath? Philistines. They did not get rid of the Philistines. They're still around. Okay, so there's quite a few people. Um, wait, I said the Amorites. That's not right. Gideon defeated the Midian. Midian. Midianites. I'm sorry, that was incorrect on my part. So, anyway, Judges. Um, the first chapter of Judges goes through each tribe and how they failed to drive out all the Canaanites from the land. As long as Joshua was alive, the people, the people followed God. Joshua was a great leader. The people did what they were supposed to do. But once Joshua died and a new generation grew up, they began to worship idols, specifically the Baals that the Canaanites worshipped. They're doing exactly what God said they would do yeah. if they didn't drive them if they, out. If you didn't drive them out, this is what you're going to start serving. You're going to intermarry with them. You're going to start ser uh, serving the idols too. Um, in Judges 2, verse 16, it says God will raise up judges. And so he decides to take to, to bring in these guys that are going to be a judge for the people. And um, they are going to repeatedly save the people from the, pe the same people that they refused to push out of the land, basically. Um, judges include stories like Deborah, Jephthah, Gideon, Samson, and Delilah. An interesting story how the Benjaminites got wives. <laughs> it's thrown in there at the end. It's a really great story. Um, the very last verse of Judges is telling. The very last verse of Judges says, In those days Israel had no king and everybody did as they saw fit. So all of a sudden <laughs> things aren't going just real well all the time. All right, and it, and it all goes back to what God told them to do and them not doing what God told them to do. So during this time period, most people say Ruth happened. <clears throat> Obviously, um, the nation was experiencing foreign oppression. It's just a glimpse into the private lives of a few members of the Israelite family because what happened to, um, to Naomi's husband and Ruth's husband? They died. It doesn't, it doesn't even say how they died. You know, were they, did they die in battles? Did they die from, yeah, they died. Um, is Ruth an Israelite? She's a Moabite. The most interesting part of Jesus' genealogy is, is Ruth and Rahab that aren't even Israelite people. Ruth is a Moabite. It's very interesting. God's all about preserving that little seed. He's like, okay, so I've got Ruth, who is a uh, Moabite and who um, has no husband. And who does she end up marrying at the end of Ruth? Boaz the Israelite, okay? Uh, the last few scriptures in Ruth are the genealogy that leads to King David. That's impressive. So, moving on, you get to the books of First and Second Samuel, and I know they're kind of... Oh, where is second? Oh, yeah, there is it. First and second Samuel. Okay. Um, Samuel will be the last and final judge of Israel. Samuel is also a prophet. Uh, the Philistines are causing all kinds of problems. And early on in the book, the people come to Samuel, and what do they want? The king. The king. They want a king. <laughs> They want a king. What are their reasons for wanting a king? Everybody else has a king. Everybody else has a king. <laughs> Everybody else has an instrument in their church. Why can't we? <laughs> they wanted a king. They wanted a king. <laughs> yeah, they were not like everybody else. Who was supposed to be their king? God was. That's right. They said, we want a king that will lead us out into battles. Uh, they wanted a fairy tale, apparently. So, it will be Samuel's job, God will relent, and it will be Samuel's job to appoint the first two kings of Israel, a united kingdom, a united Israel, a united 12 tribes. First king is Saul. Good king or bad king? <laughs> kind of fell off the deep end, didn't he? Um, Samuel will give the account of Saul and his kingship failure. Then Samuel will anoint a young boy named David. And uh, the book of Samuel will tell about the rise to the throne, Saul's deterioration, and finally the end of Saul's reign. In the middle of the book, you have stories of David and Goliath, a beautiful story of friendship of Jonathan. 
uh, the story of how Abigail became David's wife. Uh, there's some really great stories in there. David will end up hiding in what territory to elude Saul? Who is he hiding with? He's hiding with Philistines. Philistines. Still, he is hiding in Philistine territory. That's exactly right. So if you've been coming on Wednesday evening, you have heard DC cover the account of David's rise to the throne in 2 Samuel. But there is a clear disconnect with the tribes. I think that's the first time that you really see it. Because when, when Saul died, who immediately made David their king? Which tribe? Judah. Judah. Judah immediately said, yes, David's our king. What, where were all the other tribes? They were over here saying, no, Ishbosheth is our king. That was uh, Saul's son. And until Ishbosheth is killed, they don't rally behind David. So there is a clear distinction. Something is happening even at the beginning of David's reign with the tribes. There's some animosity. There's some stuff going on between these tribes. Uh, most of David's life is spent in battle with the people that have been allowed to stay from the book of Joshua. <laughs> chapter 7 is most likely the most important chapter in this book because God will make a promise to David that he will have an everlasting dynasty. This promise will come to ultimate fulfillment with Jesus. Again, that's in chapter 7. Um, I, I, when I taught David, I... I couldn't. I just don't know if David really understood that. That if he was thinking, "Well, yeah, I'm going to have my son and his son. It's just going to continue on down the line," kind of thing, or or did he have any knowledge that he was talking about a savior? I think he was thinking more earthly. More earthly. So even when Jesus came, they were still thinking earthly. Yeah. God's got this plan all laid out perfectly. You know, we're seeing this little bitty tiny bit of history, and he's got it. Boop, boop. Here we are right here on this little dot, and he knows what happens here. You know, and so he's got it all planned out. Um, Second Samuel also details the weaknesses in David's reign, the story of Bathsheba, the stories of David's sons, Amnon and Absalom, and the listing of his fighting men. At the end of the book, we find David buying the property that will one day be the site of the temple. He would have loved to have built it, but God said, no, you're not going to build it. Why? Why? What was the reason? He's a man of war. He's a man of war. He, you've seen too much bloodshed. And he told him, your son Solomon's going to build it. Nathan is the most notable prophet during uh, first and sec well, Second Samuel. So, First and Second Kings. It's up there. Oh, by the way, we well, we'll, might as well talk about it while we're here. I know I'm not supposed to get up, but I am. Why would Psalms be here under Second Samuel? David wrote a whole bunch of them. Psalms is interesting. It is actually a collection of psalms over a huge period of time. In fact, they say that they were, they were using the psalms when the second temple was built by Zerubbabel. So it's a, it's a massive amount of psalms. David did write some of them, but there's a lot of people that wrote the psalms. Okay, so that's there. Then why is Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Solomon, who wrote those? Solomon. Solomon. Now, Proverbs may have been written by some additional people besides Solomon, but he wrote those, so they're right there. Uh, then we get to First and Second Kings. Okay, First and Second Kings tell about the reign of Israel's third king, Solomon. But more significantly, there is a split in the nations. We have had three kings under the United Kingdom: Saul, David, and Solomon. And now it will split. Rehoboam the son of Solomon will take Judah. Jeroboam will take Israel. Once it's divided, Israel will not have one good king. Every single Israel king from there on out is bad. Is bad. He leads the people astray as well. Judah will have good kings and bad kings. There are two great prophets of God found in First and Second Kings. Who are they? 
No, no. Elijah. Elijah and Elisha. They're in the kings. Elijah. Right. There are good prophets. Yes. I know what you mean. There's a lot of prophets going on, and I've listed them here. But there were two that were written about in First and Second Kings that don't have books. Okay, so now you've got Israel prophets, and you've got Judah prophets. So first we're going to talk just a little bit about the prophets of Israel. And the first one I want to talk about is Jodah. Who was Jonah sent to? He was sent to Nineveh, the Assyrians, because God could see that they were turning bad, and he was supposed to go tell them, you need to repent. And they did for a time. Now, it's interesting, Assyria is going to eventually come and take Israel, but Jonah, during this time period, he was sent. He was sent to, to Nineveh to talk to them. Another one, Amos. Amos was a prophet to Israel. He prophesied during the reign of Jeroboam II. Actually, during that time, Israel was very prosperous um, politically and military. militarily. They, they were very, um, it was great prosperity during that time. But it was also a time of idolatry, extravagant indulgence, immorality, corruption of judicial procedures, and the oppression of the poor. When I think about that list right there, and then I think about our own country, it makes me nervous. It makes me nervous. I think, oh man, when it talks about corruption of judicial uh, procedures, I think we've got serious issues in this country. Yeah, Amos will tell the king and the people of Israel that they will be destroyed and taken into captivity. So you've got Jonah going to the people that are going to take them and talking to them, and you've got Amos telling the Israelite king, oh, by the way, you are going into captivity. Amos is the first guy that, that basically tells them that. Another prophet, uh, prophet that prophesied to Israel was Hosea. Hosea lived during the tragic final days of the northern kingdom of Israel. He wrote his book during the reign of six kings, and four of these kings were murdered. Okay. It's kind of sad. Um, Not pretty close to that. Yeah, Amos tells them they're going into captivity, and Hosea tells them who's going to take them. So, by the way, it's going to be Assyria. That's who's going to take you. That's in nine, chapter 9, verse 3. So, um, the nation that Jonah was sent to and, re and repented for a time of their sins is the very nation that will take Israel, Assyria. And just a note, even though Hosea is written to Israel, it will mention Judah 14 times. 14 times. So, now Obadiah and Nahum are over here. They're only over there because they kind of happened during this time period and they're very interesting books Obadiah <clears throat> is not written um, it was written before Israel fell and it is not written to Israel and it is not written to Judah it is written to the Edomites who are the Edomites Esau Esau's, Esau's descendants um, Edom's hostile activities have spanned the century of Israel's existence. Edom is held responsible for her failure to assist Israel and for her open aggression towards God's people. People that oppress God's people are in trouble. <laughs> if, you, if you curse my people, I will curse you. If you bless my people, I will bless you. God's watching all the time. And Obadiah is written to the Edomites. Very interesting book. <clears throat> Another book is Nahum. Nahum predicts the fall of Assyria. We talked about all the books that were prophetic. Uh, when this book was written, the Assyrians had already taken Israel. Um, and they are threatening Judah. And the focal point of this entire book is the Lord's judgment on Nineveh. Nineveh is the capital of Assyria for her oppression, cruelty, idolatry, and wickedness. The book will end with the destruction of the city of Nineveh. And that is the book of Nahum. Interesting. I have written in my Bible. 
is not good to be God's enemy. That's, that's right. Yeah. Or the enemy of God's people. It's not good there either. So, I didn't tell you anything about First Chronicles and Second Chronicles. First Chronicles tells about um, Israel's most famous and loved king, David. It's mostly about David. First Chronicles in, and Second Chronicles is about his favorite tribe, the Judah. It is because. Jesus will be the Lion of Judah. Second Chronicles is mostly about Judah and what's going on with Judah and her and her kings. So, uh, so Israel falls to Assyria. It goes away. Israel will then fall to who takes? I mean, I'm not Israel. Who takes Assyria? Babylon. <laughs> Babylon's going to take Assyria. Yeah. Uh, Judah's going to have some good kings and some bad kings. Some of the best kings are highlighted in Second Kings and Second Chronicles. That's Jehoshaphat, Hezekiah, Josiah. Um, they will also have a set of great prophets: Isaiah, Micah, Jeremiah, Habakkuk, Joel, and Zephaniah. Many of these prophets' days overlapped with the prophets of Israel. The difference was that some prophesied to Israel while others prophesied to Judah. So these, these guys, these guys and these guys are just kind of all mixed in here together. But some were prophesying only to Israel and the Edomites, and some were prophesying only to Judah during those time periods. They had their own specific set of prophets uh, that they were prophesying to. And uh, Isaiah... Isaiah charges Judah for breaking their covenant with God. He talks about discipline for a nation and discipline for Jerusalem specifically. He also warns of judgment, uh, of judgment against God. Uh, it is said that Isaiah was murdered by Judah's evil king Manasseh. Manasseh is the son of Hezekiah, a really, really great king. So it's kind of sad. What did Micah do? Micah predicted the fall of Israel and Judah. He also predicted hope for Israel and Judah in the way of a new kingdom. Some of these prophets at the end of their books or intertwined in their books start talking about a remnant of people. Isaiah did too. Yeah, a remnant, yes. There's, there is, a, no matter what all's going on with these countries falling, there are good people. Daniel was a good person. Ezekiel was a good person. There were good people in all, in all, during the, all of this time that remained faithful to God. They were having to endure all these kinds of things. Jeremiah, poor <coughs> Jeremiah, um, he was the prophet when Judah fell. He suffered at the hands of the last wicked kings of Judah. Jeremiah was sent into exile into Egypt. His most faithful friend was Baruch, who wrote down Jeremiah's words as the prophet dictated them. Jeremiah is also responsible for the book of Lamentations. As an eyewitness to the divine judgment of Jerusalem, he wrote vividly about this event. Lamentations is an overwhelming sense of loss that accompanied the destruction of his beloved city and its inhabitants sent to Babylon. That's what Lamentations is about. Habakkuk was probably a contemporary of Jeremiah. In fact, they think he lived in Jerusalem during the reigns of Josiah and Jehoiakim. He most likely saw the fulfillment of the prophecy when Jerusalem fell to the Babylonians. Um, Habakkuk is interesting. It doesn't include a letter addressed to Judah. It's a dialogue between the prophet and God. Habakkuk argues with God over his ways that appear to him unfathomable, even unjust. God's going to reply to him, and then he will respond. Habakkuk will respond with a beautiful confession of faith. It is a really interesting book. It represents the voice of the godly people still in Judah that were struggling to comprehend the ways of God. So it's a very, it's a good book to read, Habakkuk. Uh, Joel. Joel is also interesting because you see Joel, uh, he sees a massive locust plague and a severe drought that devastates Judah. 
Uh, the locusts are best understood as allegorical, representing the Babylonians, the Medes and Persians, the Greeks and the Romans. And he calls on them to repent. He also will talk about restoration and a blessing that will come only after judgment and repentance. So, Zephaniah is during this time period. Uh, Zephaniah is a person of social standing in Judah, probably related to the royal line. His intent was to announce to Judah God's approaching judgment. It includes judgment on many nations. If you read about it, you see judgment on a lot of different nations and even the city of Jerusalem. As with other prophetic books, it also predicts that a remnant will be restored. So even though these, these prophets are writing and they're writing to Judah and they're telling them you're going to be destroyed um, and you're going to be taken into captivity, it also offers them hope. It offers them hope. Then we finally get to the book of Daniel. This is where we were. Daniel is one of the captives, one of probably one of the first captives to go off into Babylon. Um, as we know from Daniel that Isaiah and Jeremiah both said that it would be King Cyrus that would allow them to go home. But while they are in Babylon, they need a prophet still. Who's the prophet during Babylonian captivity? Pastor. Up there at the top. Daniel Ezekiel. Ezekiel. They think that Ezekiel, well, they, they know he was living in Babylon at the time that he was called to be the prophet. And he's the one that told them at first, just settle down because you're going to be here for the next 70 years. You might as well, you know, make a home for yourself here. And then later on, he will, he offers them hope. So, um, there's another book that falls during this time period, and that's the book of Esther. Esther will marry a Persian king. Um, so the books of the Bible that we have not mentioned are here at the very end. So you've got your, your the books of your law, your Joshua, Judges, Ruth, the times of the kings, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, and all of these prophets that prophesied to, these, to the kingdom of Israel and to the kingdom of Judah. Then you've got homesick heroes, and that's Daniel and Esther and Ezekiel. Ezekiel's your prophet. Daniel's your prophet, too. Daniel's working right there in the middle of everything. And Esther, God puts her in just a perfect place to protect the people. He's still protecting that seed. He's protecting that seed. No matter what he does, he protects that seed. And so these are the people that we haven't talked about. And these are our home-again heroes when they return to the land. So next week, we're going to start with Ezra. And we're going to see, rather than go chapter by chapter in Ezra, what I'm going to show you is the first group of people that got to return home. Who they were, what their responsibilities were, and what, what difficulties they were going to face in doing their job. And then we'll get into Nehemiah, we'll do the same thing. There's going to be three groups that will, that will begin to return home, that Cyrus will let to return home. So that's where we're going with it. I hope this was helpful to you to kind of know where where the books of the Bible, books of the Old Testament are placed. And this is one of my most favorite things to talk about. So once I get started, blah, 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 I just keep talking. So, anyway.